Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Talking Sass. And you know what? This episode is completely different than any other episode I've done. This is a complete crossover episode with another women's wrestling podcast. And I'm so excited. But before we get started, you know, we're going to talk about patreon.com. That's where all the cool kids are. So make sure you go to patreon.com slash sassy Steffi for all the latest exclusives, including ones I'm going to have with my guests today. And you know what? There's with everybody. So go check it out. Again, it's patreon.com slash sassy Steffi. And of course, if you want to be another cool kid, you can go and follow me on social media at Sassy Steffi on Twitter and Instagram. If you are listening on your favorite podcast platform or you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Don't forget to hit that little bell notification so you never miss a second of talking to Sass. Now, like I said, on to my guest. I am so excited because she is wonderful. She's beautiful. She is talented. And we are doing a great crossover episode. You're going to get to know us like no one else has before. I've done a lot of podcasts talking about myself during wrestling and even while putting over my own podcast. But let me tell you, this is getting to know me and her very personally. And I have a lot of fun with her. We talk about her modeling. We talk about motherhood and some of the craziness that happens in pro wrestling. So I hope you guys are excited because Jade Chung and I have teamed up for a crossover episode of See You Next Tuesday in Talking Sacks. Hey, Jade, how's it going? Ah, uh, it's going great. How are you? I'm doing good. You guys are in for a treat today because we're doing a dual podcast for both of us. And we've been talking for, I don't know, maybe like half hour or so, so far yes. <laughs> <laughs> for two people who have never met. Oh it, my goodness. We were having a grand time. <laughs> so My cheeks, my cheeks literally hurt right now. <laughs> this was my face the entire time that Steffi was talking. <laughs> I must be in some kind of mood today. So I think this is going to be fantastic. <laughs> anyway, so how's it going? I know you had a busy weekend. Yes. So Ontario, now I know you're in Montreal, Ontario opened up to stage three, which I think is like the last stage that they were trying to work up to. So stage three, indoor, everything was open. So the moment it opened, I took my son to an indoor playground and he was just, I, his, his little excitement, his little heart, like his big smile, everything about it just melted my heart. It, he ran into this place and he was like, look, a swirly slide look a monkey and it's just everything was look this look that look this oh I, I I feel terrible that uh he's just been I don't want to say deprived but mm-hmm. you know he didn't get to to really be a kid um he just turned three so before this whole COVID thing happened he was uh like uh, how old was he like 18 months so, and, and around that time it was like winter and there's so many germs. I'm not like a huge germaphobe, which I kind of am, but, but I didn't go into indoor playgrounds during the winter, you know, for obvious reasons. So he doesn't, he's been in a few times when he was much younger, which he doesn't remember. Right. So this time for him going, it was, I will always treasure his excitement I so. saw your stories and stuff and he was just adorable you could tell you <laughs> both were having like a great time there was one where you had I mean you obviously had your mask on and stuff but you went down a slide and just this huge smile of him sitting on your lap like it was so adorable <laughs> thank you yes uh I was sweating I couldn't breathe like my whole <laughs> face was sw- it was so gross the moment I was able to take that mask off when we left I just threw it in the garbage. It was disgusting. I don't know how um, the schools here in Ontario, when the school year first started out, the kids were to have their masks in school, but during recess, they were fine to take it off. Then a wave hit. And then when they were, they, we, we stayed home, I think for a couple of weeks or something. And when they went back to school, they had to keep their masks on for recess. So 
Before think death. about that. Recess is, I don't know. I think recess is like 30 minutes, 30 or 45 minutes. Um, but yeah, grade ones. So they had to wear their mask the entire day from 840 when school started all the way up until three o'clock. It's just insane. Insane. Mm-hmm. So I can't even imagine. I could barely breathe yeah. being that active. And, you know, kids are way more active than, than I am right now. Especially so, right? Yes. so, yeah, just happy that indoor everything was open. We went to another playground, uh, indoor playground the next day. Next day after that, we just chilled out at the beach. Today, I actually went to the mall. I haven't stepped foot in a mall since last summer. Um, I needed to find out what my actual size was. <laughs> as <laughs> weird as that sounds, but no, I get online, it. online shopping is the worst. Yeah. It's the worst. Well, so. it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that because like recently, because obviously I'm getting br- I'm bigger and bigger with pregnancy. And I'm like, I don't want to go buy a bunch of tank tops because it's already July. Like I'm going to wear them for like a month maybe. And that's it. And like my mother-in-law is like, oh, I have a bunch of clothes that are too big. And like, she brought over some clothes, like tank tops and stuff. I'm like, okay, like I'll check them out. Like one says small, one says medium and one says large. And the small is bigger than the large. They're all different. Why women have (laughs) part of the reason, not all of the reason. But part of the reason why women have such an issue with their bodies is because the sizes are so out of whack. Like one company's small is another company's extra large. Like it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Like it's like, okay, a small and a medium. Okay, I get it. But a small, a large or an extra large, that's just nuts to me. I don't, yes, I don't get it. And you actually tweeted out like a month or two ago about finding maternity clothes. Yes. So have you found a brand that you liked or like what I did? Well, I stuck to the gap, Mm -hmm. but uh, when I went outside of the gap, I just sized up in regular clothes. What did you find that worked for you? Well, I'm sizing up in regular clothes for now. Like I'm getting maxi dresses because it's the summer. I'm like, even if next year I'm obviously going to lose weight and stuff when I, once I have Mm -hmm. a baby. I'm like, but it's still a maxi dress. It's not going to look like terrible if it's long and flowing because that's the purpose of a maxi dress. Yeah, so I'm yeah. doing a lot of that. Um, I'm buying like slightly larger clothes, like whatever. Because like with my first kid, I have a lot of winter clothes because I didn't start showing until it was late fall, early winter. So it was mm. fine. So all of that I have, but it's like summer clothes. I don't have anything. Um, I noticed... <laughs> Pat Pat is a great place for like really cheap maternity clothes that are like oh. decent quality. Cause like, I don't want to go and spend $40 on a pair of shorts. I'm going to wear two or three more times. And then it's the end of summer. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Like if I'm going to yeah. wear them from now until next summer and next summer after that, and next summer after that, no problem. I have no problem spending that money, but I, maternity clothes, a are ugly as all get up. <laughs> and <laughs> And B, they're expensive and you only wear so expensive. For a, a couple of weeks, maybe, maybe if you're lucky, two or three months because you change so drastically in size in mm-hmm. those nine months that you're pregnant. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's like, come on, there's got to be some kind of break here. Can I at least get something cute? Like, I don't want to look like a rose or something frilly and that kind of stuff like all the time. Yeah. Okay. Once in a while. Sure. But like, that's all you see in maternity clothes is like this really, and the like mom life. Like, I don't want that. Like, I don't want that. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I think, I even told my husband, I was like, we need to find like a manufacturer and start making like cool maternity clothes like cool, yeah. that are affordable. Cause like, like I said, some of these places are way too expensive. And even some of the stores here in like Montreal, like I, when I was pregnant my first time, I went to, God, I can't even remember what it was called now. It was Mother Time or something like that. But it's out of business now because of COVID. So it's like, you can't even. And if you go to like Old Navy or H&M or places I would normally shop, the maternity section is like five t-shirts and a pair of jeans. And that's their Mm -hmm. selection. And they're like, oh, well, just go online. And I'm like, but online, like you said, I don't know how it's going to fit. 
it's crazy. Yeah. How now do you find it your do you find it different like your pregnancy this time around completely opposite from with your son? No, actually it's very similar. Like at, when I first found out I was pregnant, I was having a little bit of morning sickness. And, you know, obviously because of COVID, I was like putting my hands in hand sanitizer all the time. And there was mm. like one or two brands that absolutely made me want to throw up the smell of it. I was like, like, this is, I guess this is what morning sickness feels like. Cause I've never had that. Thank God, knock on wood with my son or currently. Yeah. So I'm like, thank God, you know, but that was like the only difference. Like, and with my first pregnancy, I didn't crave anything really. Like there was like two or three times where I was like, I have to have ice cream or I have to have a grilled cheese. Like those were my things. Oh, but now, yum. But now I, I still haven't had any real cravings. I would say I'm, but I do love fruit this time. Like, I don't know if it's because it's summer, but I'm like <laughs> all the watermelon, all the cherries, all the grapes, <laughs> give me all of it. I want all of it. Apples, peaches, let's go. All Ooh. Of fruit. Yeah, so thank God that's healthy. Because <laughs> last time, like, I'd be like, honey, I really want a cheeseburger from like the greasiest, dirtiest, like not dirty, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like dirty food eating. Like, yeah, I yeah. want all the like unhealthy stuff this time oh, yeah. in the summertime right now. We'll see what, what happens in the fall and the winter time. Uh, I want all the healthy, nice fruits and stuff so far. So yeah. knock on wood, that stays the same. <laughs> Any wild, like crazy combos that you've craved? Oh, no. like my husband, like my, actually my aunt was telling me, she was like, yeah, I remember when I was pregnant with, with my cousins at the time, like years and years and years ago, like I wanted, like, I think she said like pickles and peanut butter or something and I was like oh together oh so bizarre yeah like she would dip oh. in yeah Ooh. I was like no 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 nothing like that thank god <laughs> like I don't have like weird tastes like anyway I well I think I don't anyway like you know I like ranch to dip all my stuff in and that's, that's normal, normal. That's, part, good. So. Yeah. that's normal <laughs> yeah. for me it was just I was obsessed with eating um just avocado mm -hmm. and then with Tabasco in it that was oh, it okay. yeah I don't think that's that that not drastic like pickles yeah. and and peanut butter together but like <laughs> but I loved it I ate so much of it and I actually became um allergic to avocado later oh, on no. like post yeah it was really that weird. Sucks. Awful. <laughs> I developed so many allergies, like oh, post crazy. baby. Crazy. It is started... that's how like your body changes. Oh my gosh. Not just like your body, but like like you said, you have allergies. I think I developed to be, you know, maybe lightly lactose intolerant. Like mm -hmm. thankfully, not like crazy lactose or anything. Like I hear horror stories, some people, but it's like crazy, like hormonally physically emotionally what having a baby does to your body we go through so much like yeah. husbands men partners <laughs> like you better fucking help us when we're pregnant <laughs> like yeah we do we go through so much shit mm -hmm. just to have our little perfect baby <laughs> yeah it's crazy because like even cleaning becomes like obviously it's a chore already but it's a bigger chore because like you can't really bend over to like sweep under your bed or under the couch or something because you can't physically bend over without like all your weight toppling you over because you're so top heavy now it's like see everything so I've, harder i never experienced that because oh, okay. i i have <laughs> mine well no mine um came two months early. So I never got to the point where I was super big and I wanted that. I wanted it so bad. I wanted the whole experience. I wanted the big belly. I wanted it all, but he came early. He actually came a week early that I was supposed to get my maternity photos done. So Aww. I know you ruined so all sad. Of big plans. <laughs> so sad. Mine. And and yeah, and you know what? That's like my only regret is that I didn't want it. I was really weird. I didn't want to get a lot of 
pictures of my belly showing. Mm -hmm. So even with my husband, I said, okay, if you're like, if you're taking pictures of us, like, don't, don't show my belly. Yeah. And I just wanted it to be, cause I, I got this gorgeous dress to, to, to wear for the shoot. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to show off my belly until, until I get this photo shoot done. Mm -hmm. Well, that never happened. And I'm very thankful that I did progress photos Mm -hmm. because those were the only photos I had. The mm. only photos I had, like maybe one or two that um, that we'd take as a family. Like if you know my oldest would like have his hand on my belly, mm-hmm. then we'd take a photo like that. But I I didn't have any photos with my husband. Mm-hmm. I have zero photos but... with him. Yeah. So sure. anyone with a belly out there, take all the dang photos. <laughs> take them all because you just never you just never know. Definitely. And yeah. And you know, and I don't I, go ahead. I don't know if I, I don't know if I can do this again. I yeah. don't know if it's because my son is like wild, <laughs> wild, wild. I want to try so hard for a girl, but uh, oh, this mama is tired. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. Like right now, my husband all the time, he's like, why are you so tired? Why do you want to go to bed? I'm like, I'm going a human being like, and I'm chasing a toddler. Like, why do you think I want to go to bed? I mean, granted, he, he is amazing father helps out 100% all the time. But a lot of times, like when I pick him up from daycare, he's still working. So it's me, I'm cooking dinner. I'm trying to play with him and that kind of stuff. So it's like, it's, it's very taxing on your body, especially when you're already growing another human being mm-hmm. inside of you and I know like physically you're thinking oh you you shouldn't be tired from growing a human being but it takes a toll on you like it really really oh does. my it's gosh really... yes but I, I had the same time Oof. I uh, like kudos to you because <laughs> honestly growing a human chasing a toddler like I can't imagine I I had my own daycare mm-hmm. um when I was pregnant and when nap time came for them, I was so, so thankful. And I like, I napped too. I had to, or else yeah. I couldn't function. Like it, it's very, uh, it's like you, it, when you're that tired, you, you sometimes have no choice because your eyes are literally shutting on you. <laughs> yeah. Like this, a couple, well, it'll be two weeks ago now when this airs, I wanted to really watch Space Jam when it first came out, the new one, the new legacy. And like, I don't know, maybe like 20, 30 minutes in, I'm passed out. My husband's like, you wanted to watch this movie. I'm like, yeah, but when your eyes close, like, you, can't you have no choice. Yeah. It. You know, it's just, that's the way it happens. Well, whatever, you know, but you know, one of the great things, like when I, cause I mean, I only started following you probably, well, it was right before your son's birthday. Cause like I had seen you were like making this big return and I was like, oh man, like I remember <laughs> you being in the wrestling business. So like, I'm really excited about it, you know? So I'm like, I'm tuning in every time you're posting like little, little things like teasing it. And you're like, today's the day. And I'm like, all right, this is awesome. Like, who's your opponent going to be? And then you <laughs> see you like walking around and you get to the ring and you change into your boots and all this. And then you had a ring announcer, which was adorable. <laughs> and then out comes your, your son. And it was <laughs> you versus your son. And it was so cute. And then you said, like at the end, like this is his third birthday. And I was like, oh my God, this is effing adorable. Like the best, I, you can't say, you know, eff, uh, adorable when you're talking about a <laughs> year old little boy, but it's so, so cute. And I was like, oh my God, I love this so much. That, that was like the best. Thank you so much. I, I wanted to wish him a happy birthday somehow. And he is literally just a huge fan of wrestling. We never pushed it on him or anything. Mm -hmm. He just started liking it on his own because we watch, uh, like I watch a lot of it during the day. Um, And so he started picking stuff up and he started learning moves on his own just from pure watching. And like he does his leg slap kick and it's all just (laughs) from watching wrestling. So, uh, you know, I kind of realized I think it was like around February 
Mm-hmm. I'm watching it and I realize, oh my God, like he, he actually pays attention because when he watches his dad wrestle, he sits there and he sits so still. And if you watch his eyes, he's like watching everything, every movement from both opponents. And it's just so crazy. April comes around and I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do a little match with him. Yeah. And I wasn't, I wasn't going to go into this whole like production thing. Like I did, I was just going to put up a camera in our spare room. Cause that's usually where we wrestle. But then I started coming up with more ideas and I'm like, okay, like, I also have a friend that's in, you know, in video. So I'm like, I have to ask him and it's just going to be, it's just going to be great because I know when he looks back at it, he is just gonna just love it. It just, Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you shown him videos of you, like things that you've done within the wrestling business? So funny enough, I hadn't up until just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And that is only because my husband showed something. So he had zero idea. He, he like, he knew, like he knows we'll ask him, well, what's mommy's name. And he'll say like my actual real name. And he'll say, well, what's mommy's wrestling name. And he'll say Jay Chung. So he'll say the same thing for his dad. So he knows like the difference and he kind of like, he knew I had a wrestling name, but I don't think he knew that I was in wrestling. So Josh shows him uh, a video and he's like, Oh, mommy's mommy wrestling. Oh, there she is. And then, so then I started showing him more, um, when it was just him and I, and now he's just crazy about it. And I, I put, I put our match on his tablet so that he can now access it. And he just, he loves wrestling it. And he, now he has started to, um, copy, uh, read my commentator started copying what he's saying. And he, he would go like DDT, DDT when he's playing with his little action figures and stuff. It's so cute. <laughs> now, obviously besides daddy, does he have another favorite wrestler? I'm trying to think. Um, I, I don't know. Okay. He, he loves, he loves to watch like he loves to watch it all. He yeah. knows the difference. So if something is on TV, he'll be like, mommy, is that NXT UK? I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> yeah, it is NXT UK. And then other, other times he'd be like, oh, look, it's NXT. Like, it just baffles me that he knows, you know, the difference mm-hmm. between NXT and NXT UK. I'm, so I'm <laughs> very, very proud of that. <laughs> That's awesome though. Like for me, like we don't really play wrestling in the house too often especially he goes to bed right when everything's coming on anyway for the most part so like if he's seen it he's seen it like just randomly like for the most part plus he I mean obviously you know how toddlers can be like he goes around like no don't do that and smacks like not in not necessarily me or my husband or our dog but like Mm -hmm. the table and I'm like no no we don't smack and we don't hit so like I try to keep that totally separate from him but like Mm -hmm. sometimes like I'll be working on something for the podcast and he'll just happen to come over and he'll be like, Oh, mommy, mommy. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that's me. I'm so, (laughs) it's like, obviously now, I mean, he's never seen me with bright flaming red hair. Yes. Except for in pictures and videos, but like, he still recognizes me and I'm like, Oh, that's my little sweetheart. I love it. I love it. He's the best. Oh, but I mean, we all think that about our kids anyway, right? (laughs) They're all the best. That's true. (laughs) And speaking of our kids, Mm -hmm. how did you transition from wrestling to being a mom? Oh man. So that was crazy for me because my last, like, it's not really an official match per se, but the last match that I had was, was it three? It it would be almost three years. No, it'd be three years ago. So three years ago, I would, I had an extra spot with WWE and I wrestled Alexandra Bale before the, um, doors opened and all that, you know, like the little tryout yeah. spots. Yeah. Things. So I wrestled Alexandra Bale and it was awesome because afterwards, and I actually just tweeted about this not, not that long ago. Um, Carmella was SmackDown women's champion at the time. And like during that, you know, Raw and SmackDown have two totally separate locker room two separate rosters and all that. 
So I had never met Carmela or anything like that. And that day I hadn't seen her enough to say like, hello, like I might've seen her like walking down the hallway, but not like enough to be like, hi, I'm Stephanie. How are you? Nice to meet you kind of thing, which is yeah. what you do. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we have this match and, um, me and Alexandra, we, uh, go under the ring and we go back and we're just waiting and watching everybody. And we see Carmela who was over where the commentary sit. She got up and she ran over to, we were at the opposite corner. She ran over to us and she's like, she introduced herself and uh, she was like, so here's, you guys, do you want some advice? Do you mind? And I was like, of course, like, please, you're SmackDown Women's Champion. Of course, yeah. advice from the woman who is, you know, basically the WWE entrusting with everything that they're doing right now on SmackDown. And she was so unbelievably sweet. I mean, it must have been maybe five, 10 minutes she talked to us and just unbelievably kind. And like, I was like, I'm gonna take all this advice and I'm gonna put it into my wrestling. And then like the next month I went to Greece. So like, I didn't take any bookings for a month because I was like, I'm going on vacation. I wanna make sure I don't break or bruise or anything. Like I wanna have like a great vacation. Mm -hmm. And then I got pregnant while I was on vacation. So it's like, I oh. never returned to wrestling. So it's like, I had all this advice from Carmela that she gave me and never got to use it so it, you know obviously that sucks but mm -hmm. you know it just like transitioning was very hard because like from that point to when I became a mother and then before I started the podcast like I was like I feel like something's missing I mean obviously I have this brand new spot in my heart that's full from having my own child but then like something's missing that 12, 13 years that I wrestled, like I need like something to fill that spot. And my husband who, you know, he knew I went to broadcasting school and all that kind of stuff. But when I moved to Montreal, I don't know French. So it's very difficult for someone to get a job in broadcasting anyway, because usually you have to be within the circle. And like when I was in Cleveland, where I went to school, I was interning at uh, two different radio stations. I was running in all these circles. I was meeting all these people. In fact, like, um, I don't know if you know who he is, uh, Chris Van Vliet, who does a podcast also. Mm -hmm. He yeah. was actually an entertainment reporter in Cleveland at that time. Oh. So, like, I got to know him a little bit through there. And so like little worlds collide, you know? So it's like, I met a lot of people in Cleveland and then I moved to Montreal and I, I didn't know anybody in the broadcasting, you know, area here. And I was like, plus I don't know French. So it's, it's not, we have completely English stations and stuff like that. So like, if I had an in, I probably could have got in, but I didn't know anybody. And it's one of those things where like, you have to know somebody to kind of get, oh. or they have to like, hear your sizzle reel and stuff. And because I didn't have anything extremely professional and they didn't know me, it, it's very difficult. Like I had my radio station at school, but it's not the same thing as a radio station on the air. You know what I mean? Like that mm -hmm. you can listen to on your radio. So like, I was like, you know, there's something missing when, you know, I stopped wrestling and like after, you know, obviously, you know, the first couple of months with a child or with a baby is very, very difficult. So, yes. you know, once I got through that and everything was great, I'm like, there's still like a piece of me that I feel like is missing. And he's like, why don't you do a podcast? Like do a wrestling podcast. Maybe that'll help. And I was like, you know what? And there's so many people like, because I'm in Canada now that I don't get to talk to on a regular basis because, you know, if they don't have an iPhone, they can't iMessage me. And mm -hmm. if you, if they have like, let's say um, Android or whatever, it's going to cost money to text. So it's like, mm -hmm. okay, you have Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, but some people aren't, you know, they'd just rather text somebody and be done with it than open up a, you know, an app or whatever. And, and it's excuses, but I mean, it's the way life is, unfortunately, you know? Yeah. So it's like, even though these people were still my friends or whatever, like I wasn't having those interactions that like, I used to have with them. So it's like, I felt like a lot of my friends had kind of gone away by the side too. And partly my fault, partly their fault because of, you know, the, the border, of course. So 
Mm-hmm. And I haven't been to the U.S. obviously since COVID started. And, and even before that, my last time I was in Ohio was for a wrestling show. So over three years ago, you know, wow. so it's like it, it's difficult, but now it's like, okay, I have the podcast and like, I can talk to my friends and a lot of my friends are doing great things. Like I know you've had Jessica Havoc on your show. She's yes. one of my really good friends from back when I was in Ohio. I mean, we were practically we weren't wrestling each other. We were tagging together. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we were basically side by side for many years. And, you know, now to see what she's doing. And of course, on Slammiversary, she became tag team champion with uh, Rosemary. Yes. Like, yep. it's just amazing to be able to have like my friends on that I haven't talked to or haven't really got to see or anything like that. And just kind of shoot the shit and have a good time. And mm-hmm. like that has fulfilled so much of, that void that was missing from wrestling that mm-hmm. like, I don't feel like I miss wrestling as much now. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Okay, cool. So How about you? Base, you said it was so, difficult for you too, right? Yeah. So pretty much the same thing with you. Um, except the part where you said, okay, you know, after the three months of, uh, you know, their first life, like, no, 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 not for me. Oh, <laughs> it really? was like, <laughs> oh no, it was like, after he was one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's partly my fault. Um, that's mainly because he was premature Mm -hmm. and with that came a lot of, uh, I don't want to say anxiety, not anxiety, but just, I worried about everything, every single thing I worried about weight, what he's eating, his sleep, And it didn't help that when he was in the NICU, he was being woken up every three hours for a feed. So with those three hours, he carried on when he got home. So, and me being a, you know, a first time mom, because I'm also a bonus mom, first time mom, I'm like super excited, you know, and especially when he was home, I was so excited that he was home. I didn't care. I woke up. I always, my husband's like, you're insane. Cause he would say, I would wake up every three hours with the biggest smile on my face Aww. and just looking, <laughs> just, just wide awake, ready to feed him. And I did that for, you know, 11 months. That's rough. Yeah. And And I was a zombie, obviously. And then finally, I'm like, you know what? Like, I can't keep, I I, I can't keep worrying about this. Mm -hmm. He's he, and he was a chunky baby. So he was super healthy. He was good. But that, that little feeling inside me, just because I was in the NICU and just what, you know, what he went through, um, it, it still pained me just to kind of think about it again, to, 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 to go back to that. But, you know, that's something that those were issues that I had to work through myself. So I finally pushed through it and I started to sleep train him myself, which didn't really work. Um, I actually had to hire a sleep consultant and um, through that, he started sleeping. Okay. He's Mm -hmm. still a terrible sleeper till this day, but I, I just, yeah, I just think that's with, you know, think that may be a preemie thing mm-hmm. I read a lot that they, they they have sleep issues I don't know yeah so um so it was hard it was hard for the first year for me and um I'd say about six or seven months in I think that's when I started going to shows again um and just you know watching my husband but just being there and and just watching it live and being around a crowd and just listening to the crowd it's a whole different feeling Mm -hmm. you know um yeah and this same thing with you I just felt like there was still something missing like your your son completes you yeah and you have so much love in your heart and you and you love to spend so much time with him But then there's like that piece and it's like a piece of your identity that you need, you know, Um, and wrestling was my identity. And luckily I did work uh, backstage for, I'd say a year. I did work backstage for a year, which did help. And then my son just got super, uh, 
crazy and just wandered and loved to run around. So it was hard for me to do backstage stuff and like, and, and chase him. And it was just too much. So I had to stop that. And that's where I was like, okay, well, I'm not really doing anything. And I also, I had the playback impact plus playback with my husband where it was a Twitch show for impact wrestling, where we'd watch old TNA impact wrestling. And that was great. Every Wednesday, it was like our, our own date night. We'd drive to Toronto, which was an hour away and we'd order Uber eats or skip the dishes, which is really nice. Cause we don't have it here where oh, we live. Really? Oh my gosh. It's, it's a small town. So no one wants to deliver to us. Um, <laughs> so we took advantage like once a week, at least. Oh my gosh. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I want all the food. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. So, and then once that got taken away early this year, um, I felt really lost. It mm -hmm. sounds silly, but like, oh, I, I think totally people, can. people tend to forget, like when you've been in the business for so long, you of loved something for so long, you know, and we're talking like 15 plus years. So you've been a part of something for that long and just to have nothing, like absolutely nothing to do with it, just hurt my soul. Yeah. And also my husband suggested a podcast He's and husband. I was like, they know what they're talking about sometimes. Yeah. We're like, what's up with them? You know, <laughs> are they wrestlers or something? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, uh, okay, I'll do it. Sure. And I hate talking. Really? Yes. I would never I, have guessed that from your personality and everything like that. Never. I have always been terrified of promos. Always have been scared of the camera always, always. And so this was like something for me, not only to stay in wrestling, but to also try something. And they always say, like, if you're not pushing yourself or challenging yourself, like, you know, what are you doing? No, I have a question for you because you said you've been afraid of the camera promos and all that you have so many amazing modeling accomplishments how are you afraid <laughs> of the, the not the computer but the camera like to me that's baffling because like i told you beforehand there was a couple of things i wanted to talk to you about i mean at 12 years old you were model you started modeling in 2002 you won the cover girl title from the vietnamese fashion magazine uh, you were one of 500 models selected to represent import fest 2003 in toronto you're a top 10 <laughs> finalist in the 2004 Miss V uh, Canada pageant. And my favorite, and that I really want to talk about the most, is you were an extra in Ashanti's Rain On Me video. This doesn't oh sound like you were afraid <laughs> of the camera. This sounds like you love to be in front of it. Oh my gosh. So I haven't even talked about any of that in years. <laughs> so this is wild to me that you're bringing this up. Uh, yes. So I started modeling. So here's the difference, right? Okay. okay. Especially in ring of honor, I was terrified. And part of that is because I was partly terrified of Gabe only because like, he was like the big guy and I always wanted to impress him. And I want, and I wanted everything to be perfect because I'm also a perfectionist, which is terrible, but not really. But to me, it's, you know, it, it weighs on me anyway. Yeah, it's your own, you know, psycho, um, psychoanalysis in your head that you're doing of yourself. Yes. Yes. So with me, I feel like promos, people are going to listen to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's something about talking and then there's, there's something about it just coming from me. Sounds weird. I know. Don't judge me. <laughs> I'm really weird. I'm really weird, but I get so nervous, but with modeling, I can just runway was my like absolute favorite thing run. You could just walk out there and you, you can't really see people. Cause it's usually dark. Mm -hmm. You can't see, you just gotta just do your thing and walk. That's it. That's it. There's no talking involved yeah. pictures, pictures. I still feel very awkward to this day. Mm -hmm. Um, but I always tell myself the, the more awkward you feel, the best pictures you get out of it. Really? I'm going to have to remember. Yeah. 
<laughs> so like all the, like the awkward poses and stuff, yeah. it actually turns out really good. Hmm. So, yeah. So how did you become a extra in Ashanti's video? Because I mean, back in the early 2000s, Ashanti was like one of the biggest names in R&B and rap. She was so huge. Yeah. I went, I remember I saw her in concert. She did like a radio concert in Cleveland and it was one of those bizarre concerts where they have like a little bit of everything. I think Avril Lavigne and Naughty by Nature or something was on that show as well. Like, <laughs> very eclectic mix of yeah are. like Aaron Carter might have even been on that show I don't know like because I went to so many of them it's hard to keep track of like what eight artists were on which shows exactly mm -hmm. yeah so like how did you get a part of that and was that as fun as it sounds like it would be okay so it's not as a it's not a glamorous story as you would okay. think it kind of just happened. So I was actually out with my cousin. We were at a uh, square one mall. It was in Mississauga and uh, we were just shopping. And then this guy comes around and he's like, Hey, uh, Ashanti is, is filming her next video or her, her next music video. If you want to come out, be a part of it, come on over to da, 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 da. We're like, uh, okay. We love Ashanti. Sure. And literally that's, all that's how they got their extras they called people over and whoever actually uh believed him went and lo and behold there she was and i actually i was cleaning out my dad's uh place mm -hmm. a, a month ago and i found those pictures because i also took some like sneaky shots of her oh so i'm so glad you you brought it up because i'm gonna go look for them because i saved them i'm like yeah i'm gonna save this those shanti she was like right in front of me and she was yeah she was so nice she was such a sweetheart um a, a little oh i don't like to i don't like to talk bad about people but she seemed a little bit of a prima donna but i think it's because maybe she had a long shoot day she was just kind of grumpy um I get it, but yeah, I was like, in there for sure. But I was so excited to to see her and like I wanted to talk to her, of course, you know. Um, but yeah, that that was it. I was I was wearing super casual clothes. <laughs> She's all done up in this sparkly like red carpet dress, mm -hmm. and here I am in white flared jeans and this neon. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm telling you this this neon orange tank top but it was a j-lo tank top okay <laughs> i don't know what the fuck i was wearing white pants and a fucking neon orange <sighs> anyhow i don't know how they didn't tell me to kind of like move to the back yeah. because i was so bright but if you watch the video uh rain on me in the scene where she comes out of the car and everyone starts snapping photos you'll see like, well, the only orange shirt, that's me. <laughs> I'm gonna, like, I was just going to say after this, I'm going to go and I'm going to look for this because I want to see this. Like, where I'm just in the background. In the background. Because like, I've never had anything like that happen to me. But like, when I was, this is like one of the funnest stories like that could have ever accidentally have happened. And I have it on my former YouTube channel. I was in, well, I was in between working at the radio station and going to school. And I had a couple of hours to burn. So I was like, all right, you know what? I know Avengers is filming in Cleveland. This is the first one. Oh. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go and see where the set is. And I'm just going to take some pictures, whatever, you know? So I find it, it's like the middle of the afternoon. I don't know, on a, like a Tuesday or something. And no, like everybody's downtown, they're at work. They're not, you know, there's no one really out walking around. So I find the, the set and I'm like, oh man, this is awesome. Cause it's the last scene of the movie. If you guys haven't seen Avengers, I don't know what the hell is wrong with you. <laughs> the end of the movie, And it's where Loki's um, uh, space, whatever you want to call it, uh, not really shuttle or rocket or whatever, but whatever he was riding on was already crashed and is the scene in New York where everything's like on fire. There's a Dr. Pepper upside down truck. 
and like taxis are smashed and buildings are destroyed and all that. So I'm like, oh, this is cool. So like I'm taking pictures and I hear this, this guy from like the other end and he's like, hey, hey. And I notice he's a Cleveland police officer. And I'm like, oh shit. Like, I'm, is there like- You in trouble. Yeah. Like, <laughs> is there like a sign that I didn't see that said I couldn't take pictures? Uh-huh. I come down and he's like, hey, do you want to take a tour of the set? Oh my gosh. And I was like, <laughs> Um, this is like going to be the biggest movie that ever comes out up until that, you know, point in time. So I'm like, of course. So I was like, do you mind if I record this? And he's like, I can't know about it. I was like, okay. Wow. He's cool. He had those cameras that were like the size of an iPhone, but like a recorded <laughs> video. So I had it in my hand and I had my phone behind it. So I'm walking around going like this, like, this is amazing. Like, look at all this. <laughs> and the, like, the <laughs> like, talking to me, having like this great time and nobody's on set. It's just the destroyed wow. scene, uh, scene. And so like we walk by and there's, there's, I don't know, a couple of men sitting there who are like set workers or something. And, and they're talking to me and they're like, oh, with that bright red hair, are you a superhero? I was like, no, but I'm a wrestler. So of course they get interested in that. And I was like, okay, whatever. And then we still, we walk down the scene and like I'm crunching glass, like the sugar glass from like <laughs> stuff underneath my feet. And I'm like, this is pretty much the coolest wow. I've ever been a part of, even though I'm not necessarily a part of it. So if you guys go on YouTube, find Miss Sassy Steffi. That was a channel there. I think there's two videos. So go, you guys can check that out. And like, that's so I, awesome. I'm not a comic book person. I never have been. Um, and I still not, but I do love the Marvel movies and I follow pretty much the whole MCU universe now. But like at that time I was like, who the hell's Loki? I don't know. I was like, I know who Thor is. <laughs> you know, I know who Captain America <laughs> is, but I, I didn't know otherwise than that. You know what I mean? And Hulk and all the major ones, like I knew obviously. So, but it was, it was so much fun. Like, and so completely random, like, and lucky to be at the perfect place at the perfect time for that police officer to see me and nobody else be around. No kidding. Oh my goodness. That was a complete like swerve. <laughs> yeah. Like I really did. Like I thought I was in trouble. Yeah. It was totally like, cool. like, hell yeah. Of course I want to tour this place. <laughs> yeah, I'm I mean, just taking pictures. Knew, like I said, everybody knew Avengers was going to be the biggest blockbuster of its time when it came out. Yeah. So, for somebody to be like, do you want to take a tour? I'm like, that's like, who's going to say no? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's like, I just, I was recently watching the videos actually, because I was telling somebody about it and I was like, oh my God, I haven't watched those videos in so long. And I mean, that was like 2011 or 2010, maybe. Oh, that's crazy. We recording the movie. So yeah, so it's been like 10 years. So I was like, I haven't even watched those movies and such or videos in such a long time that I actually went back and rewatched it. And I was like, oh my God, that was so, even now it's so crazy to think that that happens. So. Wow. Random. Okay. I have to ask yeah. because she's staring right at me and I, oh, uh, I absolutely love her. She's my favorite, most favorite ever. Tell me, why do you love Sherry? Oh man, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> so ever since I was a little kid, I mean, my parents, they went to WrestleMania three. They went to the first ever Survivor Series. Oh, It was always on in my house. Like my mom had this embarrassing story. Well, when she was alive, she would tell the story all the time. And I was like, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. Like, please stop. But now like that she's gone, like I tell the story and I'm kind of like, why am I telling people this embarrassing story about myself? But I <laughs> do because it's like in memory of my mom. So like when I would go to my grandparents' house, you know, like wrestling was on like Saturday mornings or something. So like I would go on with my, my grandparents and like I'd be sitting there watching and, my, and apparently when I was that age, I don't remember, like I was like probably three. You know, I would sit there and like go like this, like trying to dodge the, sorry for those who are listening on podcast. I would try to dodge the punches. <laughs> I was kind of like, you know, an animated little kid. And uh, when it was commercial time, I would run to the washroom. I, you know, do my business. And then I'd come back with my, my pants around my ankles still because I didn't want to miss a second of the wrestling. <laughs> 
So like, it's always on in my family. And like I said, I don't remember this stuff, obviously, but I tell the story because my mom loved telling that story so much too. But like the <laughs> time I remember wrestling really appealing to me is when Sensational Sherry started coming out with Shawn Michaels with the mirror and she was fawning all over him. And it was just this big glamorous thing. Cause I mean, back then you had women's matches, you know, you had Wendy Richter and stuff like that, but it wasn't really appealing to me again at that time. Now I go back, I watch Wendy Richter matches all the time and Mae Young and, and so on and so forth. Thank God for YouTube. <laughs> like, it didn't appeal to me the way that this flashy, you know, woman coming out with Shawn Michaels, who I also loved, even though the whole, you know, barbershop window thing, like I still like love Shawn Michaels. So like to see one of my favorite male wrestlers with this woman, and I was just like, oh my God, this woman is everything. I love her. And that's my first real memory of wrestling. And then of course, SummerSlam, where <laughs> my, like my favorite matches ever, like I like matches that tell actual stories like not just we're doing these moves for these reasons and there's a story within it but like I love that whole storyline being fed into it so mm -hmm. at SummerSlam when it was Shawn Michaels versus Rick the Model Martel and like she's faint uh, fainting on the ring and then like she's down and she just like looks up like this looks see what's going on and they had the whole you know you can't punch each other in the face thing because they're so beautiful like, and then she's fainting and then they're trying to carry her back to the locker room and stuff like things like that. Even still to this day, like I'm, when you watch my wrestling, even though it was three years plus ago, like I was very old school in that instance. Like I love that kind of like shenanigans stuff too. I mean, you didn't always get it in my matches, but I tried to incorporate some kind of mm -hmm. fun, like fun old school shenanigans and like, that's what it was to me. Like, she's just this beautiful woman. And then obviously like now I go back and I appreciate her in a different way because now I can go back and watch her matches on YouTube from the seventies and the eighties and the nineties and appreciate so much more the wrestler plus appreciate so much more what she did managing wise. I mean, to me, if I'm not going to name them all off right now, cause that's putting myself on the spot, but like, if you put <laughs> a Mount Rushmore of managers, like she deserves to be up there. I mean, she did so much for so many people's careers. I mean, not just WWE with Shawn Michaels, but you're talking, you know, she worked with Macho Man. She worked with uh, Harlem Heat. Like these are just iconic names already on their own. And then you put Sherry who's iconic in her own way and you make them like just this much bigger, powerful, like, I don't want to say couple cause they weren't ever couples, but and then you had the whole thing with Elizabeth and it's just like the storytelling and what she did to add her own flavor. And like, I tried like, cause of course, you know, as a manager in wrestling, it happens, you, you know, you're, you wrestle a lot, but you also manage sometimes too. And like, you want to add so much more to the match than just standing there. Cause it's that's some men out there, especially 2007 through 2010, like when my first couple of years of wrestling, like I just stood there mm -hmm. and it's awful. Like nobody gives a shit about the girl that's just standing there. Like, give me something to do, mm -hmm. you know, let me be into it. Like Sherry. And I loved it. Like everything, everything about Sherry. I'm just like, I could listen to you talk about <laughs> Sherry all night. <laughs> It, I could go on forever, but I mean, honestly, you said she's one of your favorite as well. So yes. sure pretty much everything that I just said, you could probably reiterate right back to me and <laughs> we could do a whole podcast on just the greatest things that Sensational oh. share. I'm actually surprised because you started off, well, would you say you started off wrestling? Um, I actually started ring announcing. Oh and yeah, I started I think in about 2003, so probably the same year you debuted. I started ring announcing accidentally. I worked at a bowling alley, and I was going to um, well, actually, I had to call the bar because I wasn't, you know, I didn't live in Canada at the time, so 
So the drinking age is 21. And it was at a bar on, I think it was on a Tuesday night, I'm pretty sure. And I would go every week, but I had to call the bar to make sure I could go because I wasn't, I was like 18 or 19 at the time. Please don't look up my age. <laughs> <laughs> so I started, I started, I was, um, I became friends with everybody because I, literally there was like not even 10 people in the audience most nights. And cause it's a Tuesday night, like a lot of people are working the next day or whatever, have school. So anyway, um, I made friends with pretty much everybody, the, the wrestlers, the commentators, everybody, they had, you know, a show on uh, TV on like local access. And because I was a bowling alley DJ, one of the guys that I was friends with, uh, the sex symbol, Keith Young, shout out to him. He's amazing. <laughs> Um, he came to one of my nights that I was DJing at the bowling alley, which was actually right down the street from the bar. And it was like eighties night or something. And he's like, wow, you know, you're, you're doing great. So then a couple of weeks later, like one of the, the ring announcer got sick. So he, Keith went up to the promoter and was like, Hey, you know, Stephanie knows everybody here. She's, a, you know, ring, uh, not a ring announcer, but, uh, you know, a DJ down the street at the bowling alley. Why don't you have her fill in for him tonight? So, okay, sure, no problem. So I filled in and then I filled in again and then I filled in again and I filled in again. And then of course, Lillian Garcia was the only women's ring announcer that had any notoriety at that time. Of course, now there's so many, but then, you know, so all these people in Ohio were like, hey, are you free Saturday night? Come ring announce my show. Sure, no problem whatever, you know, I was just having the time of my life because I never even thought I would ever be involved in the wrestling business at any point in my life, you know? And so one day I was at one of the shows and one of the wrestlers was like, you are obviously very passionate about this. Why don't you wrestle? And I was like, holy shit, man. It's like an epiphany. Goes <laughs> and like, why don't I, you know? So I started looking at schools and stuff in Ohio and it came down to two. It was either going to be CPAW, Cleveland All-Pro Wrestling, or Ohio Championship Wrestling. And I saw a match at OCW with uh, Chantal Taylor, who is also known as Taylor Wilde, currently in Impact, against uh, Ash. Well, then it was Lexi Lane, then Ashley Lane, and then Madison Rain, <laughs> a couple name changes later. So former uh, Impact. And it was them versus each other. And uh, Madison happened to be a wrestler in training at OCW. And because of that match, I was like, I'm choosing OCW. Mm. And it was amazing. I mean, a lot of times she was out, you know, she might not come to training because she had a show and she wasn't home yet the night before or whatever. But, and plus she was going to school. I mean, she was, I mean, the schedule she kept was insane anyway. But I mean, I trained there, fell in love with it. Like my first bump, I was like, yes, this is what I should be doing with my life. Like most people are like, oh, this hurts, which it does. But I'm like, I want more. I absolutely want more. So that's what happened. Wow. Yeah. Well, obviously I didn't know that. I was going to say, well, I didn't know that. Of course. <laughs> no worries. No worries. But I know for you, when you started training, because you trained with uh, squared circle training in Toronto, which is pretty infamous for the amount of people that have come out of that school. But what was really shocking to me when I did some of my research on you is that you went to a local show and you were actually encouraged by Beth Phoenix and Tracy Brooks to go and start training. Yeah, here in Ontario, they were basically the only girls wrestling. Like they were wrestling each other every time. And they were like, we need more girls. Like, can you just, can you train? <laughs> like they were just dying for girls and pretty much a bad breakup, bad high school breakup. And, uh, you know, I, I became very emo-ish and wrestling pulled me out of it. And I started training and basically saved my life. <laughs> we definitely like, I didn't go through a bad breakup, but wrestling, there was some bad breakups within that time. Mm -hmm. And wrestling was definitely something that, you know, changed my aspect of thinking at that time, like where I might go into like maybe a huge depression, but I guess, 
and, and it doesn't make sense the way I'm going to say this. So I'm not trying to take somebody else's mental stabilities or mental things that they're going through and make light of it. But for me, like with my wrestling schedule and everything that I had going on at the time, like I was able to switch from being depressed because of a boy to mm -hmm. wrestling and be two totally different people in that aspect that it didn't affect me, I guess, more because I was two different personalities at different times, not split personalities or anything like that, but like Sassy Steffi didn't have time to be depressed over a stupid boy who broke her heart. You know what I mean? So anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I totally, no. you used, you used that confidence and carried over to, to, to Stephanie. Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally get that for sure. What amazes me is uh, going back to Sherry, sorry, is nope. that, uh, <laughs> you don't find many like wrestlers. You don't find many female wrestlers that idolize managers. Mm-hmm. So with me, I absolutely love, I, I love managing. If I was to choose, I do love, I do love the wrestling part of it, but managing was just my absolute passion. And I think it's because I started off doing it and just the way that I got into it and learning from Shane Douglas uh, plays a huge part of it just because he is so animated just perfect like his personality is perfect I don't know how else to explain it but with him kind of uh, giving me a lot a lot of advice um, I carried that into managing and therefore it became my own art mm -hmm. and something that I really had to Oh, I really had to show for. And in the business at that time, you got zero respect for being a manager. So that was also like a huge, um, huge kind of, uh, oh, what's the word? Like a, like a hill or like, um, I'm just kind of like a block, a block. Yes. Yeah. For so you. it was a to kind of get over literally and figuratively yes um so it was hard and but with that being part of the story it just made managing a lot more beautiful to me I love that because like I said when you know a lot of times maybe not now because I see like a lot of females coming into the business now who don't manage as much as say I did when I first broke into the business because like you said there wasn't a lot of women to wrestle you know, and mm -hmm. I came in 2007 was my first match. So there was a lot of women talent, but unfortunately, a lot of the independent promotions couldn't afford to bring in a cheerleader, Melissa from California to Ohio, or, you know, um, a Mercedes Martinez from Connecticut to Ohio, which is a lot closer, but still a flight ticket is very expensive. And it's hard for I find at that time, it was hard for women who were seen as a potty break match at that mm -hmm. time. Thank God that has changed. Mm -hmm. um, for you to bring in that caliber talent to wrestle. So a lot of times you were wrestling the same girls over and over, like you said, you know, Beth Phoenix and um, Tracy were wrestling each other constantly. And that was the same with me. There was five girls in Ohio. There was at... 2007 there was me Nevea, Jessica Madison Rain and Zoe Sky and we wrestled each other all the time or it was a tag match all the time like you know thank god shimmer came along you know and we got to travel out a lot of times all of us together would go to shimmer and then you know we were known as the Ohio girls because we wrestled each other all the time but then you also had you know the girls coming from England who wrestled each other all the time but now the Ohio girls are getting to wrestle the girls from England. You know, you're getting some diversity. But a lot of times because those independent promotions couldn't afford to bring in those girls and you wanted to be on the show, you wanted to pay your dues, you wanted to do what you could because you wanted to be so bad in this business, they would put you with some random guy 
and uh, sometimes people you don't even know I mean this is my mm -hmm. my experience yeah. is different from you but a lot of times like I said earlier a few minutes ago you just stand there mm -hmm. like, they don't give you anything you're just like I remember and this was a person that I had worked with a lot as a manager at a place that I would say, you know, respected women's wrestling and really brought in girls for me to wrestle. But when I was in this group and I managed like the guy that I knew who I was mostly managing in this group was him. Like, I'd be like, what are we doing in the match? Don't worry, just listen to me. So like, I go to check on him when he's on the outside, we're both healed. And like, oh, just watch out, get out of the way. We're about to take a dive. Like, okay, you couldn't have told me about the dive ahead of time. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like they didn't, I, I don't feel women's wrestlers and managers were respected as well as they should have been in that time frame. at least from my perspective. Was that the same for you? I mean, because you, with Ring of Honor and PWG, I mean, you managed some huge names. I you was really lucky. I, and I always say that is I, I, I got lucky. It's all of being in the right place at the right time. Um, with me, I was young and sometimes stupid. And basically I just went with the flow. I had zero plans. I went wherever wrestling took me and that's super risky, but somehow it worked out for me. Um, I want to ask you though, Okay. Before I forget, when you started out managing, did a lot of the guys tell you uh, to just like stay over there or like they'll tell you to stand on like the side of the rings where where you won't be shown in the hard camera? Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, like I said, we weren't really respected. Like we're yeah. just random girls set there. I don't know what to be eye candy. I mean, I've never thought of myself really as eye candy. Like, I don't think I'm ugly or anything like that, but I'm not Trish Stratus or, you know, these beautiful, extravagant, gorgeous woman, women, you know, like, I'm like, I'm decent. I'm average, but like, I can do more than that. Mm -hmm. Is, did you have that problem too? Like you wanted to do more? Some with, uh, you know, those random people that you'd get stuck with, I shouldn't say stuck, but the random people that you were booked to be with, yeah. um, they would just, <laughs> <laughs> they just wouldn't give you the time of the day that they're like, Oh, you know, just kind of like stay off to the side of it. And there actually, there has been one guy, which I cannot say his name because he's on TV, but when he was kind of starting out, mm -hmm he was just all about himself and he tried to tell me to stay on the sides of the ring right without trying to tell me don't don't be in you know don't be in the hard cam so that uh, people can see that you're with me that you're managing me so i'm not stupid because this was just i don't know maybe 6 years ago so like i know camera angles i know where to work it like you can't you can't tell me to, to, to stand over there. I just looked at him. I'm like, yeah, okay. And I did my own thing. Yeah. And then this same guy, there was supposed to be, you know, you need the girls to do um, like a, the cat fight, right? So yeah. it's the, the normal spear in the middle of the ring. And then you roll out and whatever, punch, punch, punch on your way out. He was trying to suggest for us to do that on the outside. <laughs> okay right so yeah spear her on the outside and just do your cat fighting there I'm like are I've, you insane you're telling me how to do my one spot you're telling me how to do my one spot and this is for um a pretty well-known independent company mm -hmm who is actually doing TV and they have pyros, they have like, it's, it's pretty big. Yeah. So you're going to tell me who I'm, I'm managing a guy who is like an ex ECW guy, right? So you're going to tell me to do my spot on the outside. So I'm not shown in your thing. So which is part of the story that should be shown. Right. I got right. 
Oh God, how I could do it. I could talk like, like I said, in that, because I mean, basically the same frame of time. You started a couple of years before me, but still you were managing for quite a while. So, and wrestling mm-hmm. at the same time, but like mm-hmm. that same time frame, basically with just a couple of years, me shorter than you, like I could bitch and complain about so many things that are different now. And it's such a blessing to see that women don't have to put up with the same bullshit that we had to put up with back, you know, 15 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. Thank God. I'm so, so happy that the girls don't have to go through that now. Cause it was like, I mean, I'm sure there's still some, but some guys about them and they, they get independent shows. It's bound to happen. A girl yeah so is gonna get stuck with somebody that she doesn't particularly know or work with on a regular basis I'm sure it still happens but women are more likely to have matches now than Mm -hmm. just be eye candy for some random show but it's such a blessing that these girls aren't I mean I said that like six times but (laughs) and that's like to me I wish I wish I wouldn't have had to go through that but I think it makes me even though I'm bitter about certain parts of that like I think it made me a better person and wrestler in that aspect because when I had say a girl coming up and they're like oh we're gonna put this girl with you to manage or to tag with you like I knew I wanted to use that person more than what people had used me for like I had um, here in Montreal and she actually, well, we started out actually in Shimmer, but from Montreal, I had no idea who this girl was. We got stuck to, um, she was managing another girl and we were tagging together at Shimmer on the pre-show. Now, Casey Diamond was her name um, that I was tagging with. And she had this manager, Mademoiselle Rochelle. And they both spoke French. I didn't understand nothing. (laughs) <laughs> but me and Mademoiselle Rochelle really kicked it off really well together and like worked together really, 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 really well. And Shimmer used that. The, once Casey, I don't know what happened to her. She stopped wrestling for a bit of time. I think she's trying to come back now because um, I see little things in the Quebec area about her. But um, so Mademoiselle Rochelle and I, we stayed at Shimmer and we, we worked together there for a long time. And then when I started coming to Montreal for Femme Fatale, She was with another girl at the time. And then she ended up dumping her and coming with me. And then I also took her down to WSU with me because we worked so well. And she was a manager and like, she didn't take like crazy bumps or anything, but she wasn't afraid to either. Like Mm -hmm. if somebody pulled her into the ring, like I remember, I think a calamity did once at uh, shimmer and like gave her like a DVD or something. And uh, I mean, it was awesome. I was like, sweet. I'm so glad that you can, you know, do these things and get yourself over in a way too, that gets heat for me too. Like we're going to work together and make this happen. And I think a lot of that comes from me watching Sensational Sherry as well. Like Mm -hmm. she always elevated her, her man that she was managing. And I wanted to do the same for my manager. I wanted them to elevate me, but me elevate them as well. So they didn't just look like some random person standing out there in the ring that didn't belong. Like she did. I love her. And I, I still talk to her a lot. And I'm just like, ah, and it's funny. Cause sometimes like I'll be wearing my shimmer sweater and I'll like put just like a, Hey, look what I'm wearing in my story or whatever. And then Rachel's like, Oh my God, I'm wearing that too. And I was like, <laughs> we're, still, we're still like the same brain on the same wavelength. And like I said, I didn't speak French. I still barely speak French living in Quebec. And like her and I just like something clicked with us. And even though we had the language barrier, I mean, she speaks pretty good English, but at the time, maybe not as great as she does now. Mm-hmm. But, you know, so it was like, it was just crazy that, especially with the language barrier that we clicked so easily and understood and worked with each other so well. And that could happen with anybody, yeah. you know, if they just allow that to happen. And so exactly. stand here in the corner, thanks. Work together, yeah. exactly. It's just like working with the ref. This is another one of my big pet peeves. Like I could, I could go on about my pet peeves forever, but like use your ref to your advantage. Mm-hmm. Like they're there for, I was gonna say heat, but now, 
again, women have so many great opportunities working as referees, even in, you know, the greatest companies on TV right now, currently, there's all women re or women referees as well. It's amazing. And to like work with them, you know, tell your story, but use them without like, there's a difference between the ref putting himself over and you working with the ref. Mm -hmm. like, the ref should be involved in the story, but should also not be more popular than the wrestlers themselves in the case, right. except for Ab Aubrey Edwards. I don't think she tries to get a pop. <laughs> I think just because she's so amazing as a referee, she gets a pop anyway. And yes. I love that about her, but she's not trying <laughs> to get herself over, you know, it's working with the boys and just doing her job. Yeah. Anyway. Yep rant over <laughs> <laughs> so being in quebec yeah. you talk about working in ohio so you were from ohio and now you've moved to montreal quebec canada now us canadians we if we're in the business we're trying to get the fuck out of canada <laughs> so we can wrestle in the states you did the complete opposite how did you end up in Quebec. Oh, goodness. What a story. <laughs> um, okay. So I guess I have to take it back to the Femme Fatale shows because I was coming up. I Probably I lived, I lived in Ohio and I probably did four or five shows for Femme Fatale in Montreal. So I was driving those every time. It's only like an eight hour drive. It's not that bad. Plus I always either had somebody with me like Jessica or Allison Kay or somebody was always in the car with me. So one of those shows, I was, um, it was actually the show that Mademoiselle Rochelle dumped her other girl and came with me and the Midwest militia. Um, so what had happened, backstory on the show with the story so that it can get to what, <laughs> how I got to Montreal. Um, <laughs> so at the beginning of the show, Mademoiselle Rochelle's not with us. So she sets up her merch with the other girl that she was managing at the time. So during, before intermission, she had a match with this girl, that girl lost, I think Mademoiselle Rochelle maybe DDT'd her or vice versa or something, or it was about to happen or something. But anyway, the Midwest militia came out to save Mademoiselle Rochelle. And whatever happened there, there was a melee that, that ended up being a six person tag for the end of the night, Midwest militia versus other women. Um, but that's not part of the story. So I won't go into the whole, that whole match. <laughs> so during intermission, which was, I think maybe a match after this whole thing had happened, Mademoiselle Rochelle is just kind of standing there by herself because there's no room at the table that we're standing at to put her merch. And she already, she couldn't be next to the girl that she just turned on. So she's just kind of like randomly like selling her merch in this area, I guess, like a table <laughs> down from us. So anyway, I went, we were sitting there selling merch and I went to say something to Mademoiselle Rochelle. Like I said, she's probably like 10 feet away. And uh, I saw her talking to this guy and I was like, oh my God, who is that? He is gorgeous. <laughs> so after <laughs> we go back to the back, I didn't say anything to her or anything to him at that point. Cause I noticed she was in a conversation. So I was just like, I'm not going to bother. So I go into the back with Mademoiselle Rochelle and I was like, hey, who is that guy that you were talking to? She's like, oh, that's just Chris. I was like, Chris, all right. <laughs> He's hot. I didn't tell her this, but that's what I was thinking in my head. So after the show, there's a circle of people talking and uh, it was the girl I was going to work on the next show was sitting there with her boyfriend and a group of other people, which happened to include just Chris. So I walk over and uh, she's like, hey, next show we're going to work. I was just telling my boyfriend about this time we were supposed to work in New Jersey. And there's this whole crazy story about how we were supposed to work in Jersey. And it, it ended up two seconds before the match, they change it. And we end up working other people. So anyway, oh. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, so listen to this story. And I put my, my arm up on just Chris's shoulder. And like, he totally fades the shit out of me. Like, he's like, <laughs> random girl sticking her arm on me like whatever so I'm like damn <laughs> like this sucks so anyway, 
<laughs> so end of the show, whatever. So I end up going back to grab my stuff. Jessica and Allison are, um, I think I'm waiting for them. So as I'm pulling my bag towards the front door to like turn around and yell for Jess and Allison, I see Chris walking by and I stick out my hand and I'm like, hey, by the way, I'm Stephanie. And he's like, hi, I'm Chris and kisses my hand. And like, you know, like when you're watching like those uh, like Looney Tune commercials and people like melt into puddles, that's how I felt. I didn't do that in all actuality, but that's how I felt. And he's like, but I got to go. And I was like, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> like, well, that got me nowhere. <laughs> not that like, obviously I live in Ohio and Montreal, two different countries. It might not work out that well anyway, but anyway. So like we're walking down the street to go to our car. And I was like, I, I, I talk very loud anyway. Um, but I was probably screaming and I was like, oh my God, he's so hot. <laughs> You know, I'm going like crazy, like, you know, whatever. And by the time I get to the hotel, I shower and everything. I look at my Facebook and I, I already had a message from him. Ooh. And yeah. So that started um, us kind of talking back and forth. And then that led to like FaceTiming all the time and ended up into a relationship. And then um, my mom met him probably, what was it? October and she passed away in January so she just met him once in those couple of months that um, we had been dating before she passed and she told him she's like I can tell with Stephanie that this is different and when you propose I want you to use my well my mom my grandmother's rings to propose and he's like I've known this girl since July it's October you know so like, oh. what the hell <laughs> a little overwhelmed probably um so anyway um for Christmas oh no she met him at Christmas too but of course I don't know this story at all um that she told him that she wanted him to propose with the rings so I actually got him because he had never been to Wrestlemania and that year coming up Wrestlemania was in New York so I I got him ticket well him and I obviously tickets to go to Wrestlemania and uh at Wrestlemania this is after my mom three months after my mom passed uh he proposed Oh, yeah, it was it, it was great because it was at the same time that Daniel Bryan was super popular. So he proposed before the show started and all that kind of stuff. So like people were still in their seats, like there was still a lot of people, but oh, you know, everybody's going, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I love it. It was awesome. And one of our, our buddies here in, um, in Quebec, who is uh, actually runs Femme Fatale at the time, he um, came down to our seats and he was like, why don't you guys go get a picture over there with the background and everything? Cause we had pretty decent seats. And uh, he started recording and like, I thought Chris was going to tie a shoe before he, you know, was taking the picture and he proposed. And like I said, Aww. totally crazy. So with my mom passing away, my aunt lives in Ohio and my sister lives in Virginia. And basically the rest of my family spread out across the country as well. I'm like, why am I staying here? So when it came time to choose, where am I going to go? I'm engaged. I decided it's better for me to move to Quebec because that's his whole family for the most part is here in Montreal area. So it just made more sense for me to come here. So yeah, totally opposite. Like when I saw Angelina Love the first time, like after we got engaged and I was moving to Canada, she's like, you're doing the total opposite of everything. <laughs> Basically every Canadian wants to come down to the States to wrestle, but lucky for me, I'm still an American citizen. So like yeah. crossing the border is nothing for me. Like, yeah. Like I cross a gazillion times. Like, yeah, I'm going to wrestle. They're like, okay, have a great time. And then, but like when Chris was with me in the car, they're like, he's not wrestling. Is he? I'm like, nope. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a big, like for those in the United States who don't understand and like, if you follow Lofisto, you might get a, an understanding a little bit because she deals with this so frequently. <sighs> the border is a nightmare for wrestlers to try to cross. I know for Josh, it's not because he has a contract. It's, but it's still, it's for somebody in Canada to get a job within the US, you have to prove to the US that you are worth that working visa or the company mm -hmm. does. So you have to prove that 
you know, let's say Bob down the street can't do the same job that Josh Alexander can do at impact in order to prove that you're worth getting that work visa. And that's the same thing for independent wrestlers. Like a lot of people crossing the border, they have to send their gear ahead of time or do something different because if you cross the border and you get caught, like for example, a Mike Bailey situation, you know, you get banned for five years and you can't go into the US for any reason. And it's just, it's crazy to me because I'm like literally 99.9% .9 of the time you're crossing the border for $25 and you're mm -hmm. getting banned for five years. It's like, I, I'm not going to get a work visa that costs like 10 grand, like not me yeah. personally, but Canadians to go work shows for $25 here or there, or maybe a hundred dollars here or there. It doesn't, it doesn't equal out. It doesn't make sense. Like if you're working mm -hmm. for a company like impact, like your husband or AEW or WWE, which there's a lot of great Canadians in those countries or in those promotions, like a Kevin, Kevin uh, Owens or Sami Zayn or an Ethan Page or whatever, like those people have these things because they're the best at what they do from Canada and they proved it and they're able to do that. But there's some people like Lufisto who's been fighting for years and still can't manage to get a work visa from one of these great companies for whatever reason that happens to be. And it's just a shame because there's so many great people like just in Montreal, like there's so many great, great wrestlers that I think deserve to be on TV that you probably will never see because of that work visa reason. And it sucks. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's and I think, thing. yeah, I think that's like a lot for like, even Ontario as well. Yeah. Uh, all of Canada, I think we can say that. And Listen. Josh actually, yeah, Josh actually had a hard time before he was signed with Impact. Mm -hmm. Like we crossed, I was going to Candace's um, wedding reception. Mm -hmm. and they decided to tell Josh that they were going to ban him if he crosses again. But like we had, we were not doing any wrestling shows. Literally, we were going to Ohio for her wedding reception, and then we were driving straight back. Like we weren't even staying in the States. And like, just like that. And it, it, it matters if you have a border officer who is having a great day, Yes. Or if he's having a real shitty day, because you know what? He will lash out. Yeah. And you know what? That's that's the case with anything, though, because like obviously me being a permanent resident of Canada and an American citizen, I'm pretty much good to go at the border for whatever reason. But mm -hmm. if somebody's having a bad day, they can tell you across into the um, interrogation area and rip your car apart and then you're like, okay, you can go. And then you have to put like everything back. And like, they ripped everything apart. Like they went through your suitcases. I've never had this, but I've seen other people have this issue yeah. with like their clothes on the floor, on the parking lot, because they went through every single solitary piece of clothing that they had. And they just, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. so it is, it's, it really depends on who you have at the border. But I mean, it's also, they're supposed to stop you if you're a wrestler and that sucks. Mm -hmm. so much because like I said most of the time you know you're not getting a great pay to begin with but you want to go over to the United States to get this exposure like the exposure means so much more than the payday at that point because yeah. if you can go over and work a beyond wrestling or you know at the time WSU for me or a shimmer or an AIW in Cleveland like these places get you a lot of great exposure Mm -hmm. But if you're in Canada and you can't get there, like a Silesia Sparks, she was mm -hmm. um, also banned, I think, for five years, if I'm correct. I, it, ten. No. All you want to do is, is five or ten. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it was. I mean, it, it's rough because if mm -hmm. you're a Canadian wrestler on your own, like pre-COVID, it is very, very hard to get looked at by other companies. Not impossible but very difficult mm -hmm. if that's what you're looking for, which yeah. most people who get into wrestling obviously want to move on to the bigger companies. Yeah. So with being in Canada now, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you miss 
that you don't have here, like stores or certain foods, the foods. Yeah. The, which ones? Oh my God. I could go on for days. Tell oh. me what I'm missing out on. <laughs> okay. So one of my favorite things to do when I was in the States late at night, that's another big thing about Quebec. Everything closes at nine o'clock or earlier every day of the week. Um, is, is this because of COVID or this is like know. what they do? This is all the time. Oh, I mean, you, I mean, McDonald's drive throughs open through midnight and, or 24 hours. You know that, but like Walmart closes at like five o'clock on Saturday and Sunday and nine o'clock on Monday through Friday. Yeah. I don't know. It's a Quebec thing. I don't know. But in, in the States are 24 hours, but anyway, like I go to a movie and then I'm like, Oh, you know what I want? I want steak and shake. I love, love, love steak and shake. And I miss that. But Quebec also is different because not only the different times that they keep for their restaurants and their businesses and, and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. but they also are very per particular on the names of things and they want things to be in French. So like if you're going to Starbucks, yeah, we just say we're going to Starbucks. But like when you get there, it says cafe Starbucks. Like it has to have French in the name. So yeah. like something like a Denny's isn't in Quebec that I know of. I know there's one like 45 minutes away from me, but it's over the Ontario border. Um, like an IHOP, they're not here. Like, you know, some of the food oh. things, might, yeah, some of the food things I might say, you'd be like, but I have them here. But in Quebec, we don't have them. One of the biggest things that I miss is Taco Bell. There is a Taco Bell in Quebec, well, near me in Montreal, but it's not the same. It has like five items on, on the menu and it is totally not the same taste as the American Taco Bell. So every time I go back, I miss Taco Bell. But in Cleveland, like if you guys are from Cleveland or the Northeast Ohio area, you know what I'm talking about, Swenson's. It is a 50s drive-in style restaurant and you literally go in, turn on your headlights. And when your headlights are on, that brings a server to your car. So they'll give you the menu or you order or whatever. You flip your, your headlights off, they go off, they get your order. When it's ready, they bring it back. When you're done, flip on your lights. They come and get the tray, take the, you know, the, the money, whatever, flip your lights off and you leave. So good though. The, like the cheeseburgers, I think are like $3 or something. But from what I heard they're when they make the, the meat, they put brown sugar in it. So like it, the meat like melts in your mouth. It's oh. another thing I miss about Cleveland is melt, which is a gourmet grilled cheese place. It like throws meals and concoctions and like, I don't even know how else to explain it Ooh. inside of grilled cheese, but like, it's so good, but like, whew, it's just so good. And I miss that. I want, oh, I want to say that we have a melt in Toronto. I think I've been there once. It could be. I'm not sure, but wow. It's, it baffles me that you guys don't have like a Denny's or a Taco Bell. That's crazy. No. Like if you want something like, for example, wrestlers, obviously they keep long hours. If you want something, it's usually going to be A&W or, um, or McDonald's because mm -hmm. that's the only two things that are really open 24 hours unless you find like a diner. Like I know when we were going to Quebec city a lot, there was a diner that was open pretty late that we could go to mm -hmm. but for the most part. I mean, no, it's McDonald's or A and W or you're waiting till you get home to, I don't know, pull a bowl or uh, pour a bowl of cereal or something, because there's really not much choice between those two places. Wow. It is. Okay. Crazy. I'm a big foodie anyway. Yeah. Okay. So what I heard like a long, long time ago, mm -hmm. like long time ago when I was younger, if you don't speak French mm -hmm. there, nobody will help you. Is that true? Yes and no. Um, I believe, especially what I've noticed since I've been here, I've, I live in a decently populated English area. And there's, yeah, there's a really English area, like 20 minutes away from here. But um, for the most part in Montreal, if you speak English, you're good to go. They're going to be able to understand and help you. And no one's really kind of a dick about it. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, you could, you will definitely, if you're here for a long time, come across those for sure. Like I've been here now eight years yeah. and I come across that occasionally, but nothing too much. Uh, Cause my French is very poor. Like I'm first to admit it. I do Duolingo every single day. I've had like a 200 and something odd day record going right now. And I still like, if somebody says something to me and they speak very, very slowly, I can understand. Can I repeat it or try to talk back to them? Not really. Like I got bonjour, como se va, those kind of things. But like, besides the, like, honestly, like the super, 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 super basics, Mm -hmm. I can't do it. Like, I don't know why my brain, like it does it fine when I'm in the app. Like I can have conversations with the app, but like the second, like it's out in the real life, it just doesn't (laughs) compute for whatever reason. I mean, I guess, cause I took seven years of Spanish. It just, it totally outrides (laughs) everything on French. I don't know. But like, if you go to like some smaller cities, like further out from Montreal, like um, Sherbrooke or something, like it's harder because they are very much French speaking communities. And to find somebody to speak English fluently is very difficult. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the major, you know, areas like Quebec City or Montreal or so on and so forth, like the bigger cities, you're not going to have a problem for the most part, you know. But like I said, there are some people who are Quebecois and they don't care and they want you to speak French and they're just, you know, they are not very nice about it. But for the most part, you're going to get by just fine, especially in the bigger cities. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're a big Habs fan. Now, (laughs) were you always a hockey fan or did you become one when you moved to Montreal? I became one when I came to Montreal. I, in Cleveland, there's no, there's a hockey team, but it's like the minor leagues, it's the monsters. And like people will go to the games, but it was like for dollar hot dog night or $5 beer night or something. Like it wasn't like, we're going to watch them to, you know, really play. We're going to enjoy the atmosphere of a game, but we're going because there's some kind of, you know, stipulation to it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, so-and-so is like a celebrity is going to be there. Okay, well, we're going to go. Like, I know, for example, Dolph Ziggler is from the Cleveland area. He likes to go to the Monsters games because I know when I see him sometime when he's in town, not now, obviously, because I don't live there, but he'd be like, oh, I'm going to the Monsters game, you know? Cool. I never went. I never understood hockey. I am 100% a Browns girl. Cleveland Browns till I die. And um, so I, I never really watched hockey, like Columbus sports with the Blue Jackets. I didn't even know that they had a team, to be honest, like, because I didn't follow the NHL at all. Yeah. When I moved here, uh, Chris took me to my first Montreal Canadiens game. And they were doing really well that year. Um, I think it was 2012, the first game I went to. Maybe it's 2013, either way. But I loved P.K. Subban. I was like, oh, this player is amazing. I love him. I mean, I still follow him a bit. He's now with uh, the uh, New Jersey Devils, but like he still does a lot of things here in Montreal. Like every time the team plays, obviously not this year because of COVID, but previous years, he would come every time either the Nashville Predators or the Jersey Devils came to play in Montreal. When he when he was living here and playing here, he donated $10 million to the Children's Hospital. Oh. And so because of that, even though he's still not here, like he has the PKR um, arbitrarium or something like that at the hospital. And because of that, like when he played for the Predators and now plays for the Devils, when they come to Montreal, he takes players from the team and they go and visit kids at the children's hospital. Oh, and yeah, it's very sweet. Like he doesn't have to do that anymore. Like he doesn't, mm-hmm. play here, you know what I mean? But like to me, when he donated, because my um, nephew really benefited from it because he has some things that he needs to go to the children's hospital frequently for. So he really benefited from that. So when that happened, I was like, he's my favorite player. Like, I don't care. Like, and I still, like, I really enjoy him. I don't really watch too many devil's games, but when PK comes and plays here in Montreal, I'm always like, can we go to the game just because I want to see PK against the Habs? Yeah, I've, I've obviously grown to love other players on the Habs now, and I've grown to really love hockey. In fact, 
this year when they were in the Stanley Cup finals, the Bell Center was open for 3,500 people only. And um, it was $10, but you got to go, if you got a ticket, of course, uh, you got to go into the Bell Center and you got to watch the screening of the game from Tampa on the screen and to walk back into the Bell Center and be like, you see the ice because it's ready for the next game for when they come back to Montreal. And like, it's there and like, there's a DJ playing like music and getting everybody hyped for the game like beforehand. And it's just the whole vibe. Like I know people in other places, they love their teams for whatever reason, but like with the Cleveland Browns, I'm super passionate. And like, I find I fit into the Montreal Canadiens fan base just as well because they're so passionate. Like, oh, I forget what his name is um, from Tampa Bay. He was like, when, when Montreal won game three, it was like their fans went crazy like they won the Stanley Cup. And I'm like, damn right. Cause I mean, granted, I wasn't here in 93, obviously. <laughs> the last time they won the, won the championship. They haven't won in, in, you know, almost 30 years. Like, of course, wow. they're going to celebrate like crazy. They won a game in the Stanley Cup fi finals and a lot of people thought they were going to be swept. So I'm like, yeah, we partied. Like, hell yeah. Like, that's how passionate we are. Like, I love that, you know? And I love being a part of that. And I've never been a part of a championship city. I mean, the Cleveland Cavaliers won after I left. The Cleveland Indians in the nineties, they were always this close in the world series, but never got there. So like this year to be a part of a team that was in the finals. And I was like, Oh, I might be part of a championship team. I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, which is fine. Cause Tampa is obviously the better team this year. So, but it was, I love it. And hockey is so much fun and watching people beat the shit out of each other. <laughs> like, God, this is like wrestling. I love it. <laughs> Do you have any big sports that you love? Like um, guys wrestling? I used to watch football a lot. Okay. What was your team? Um, the Chargers, San okay. Diego Chargers. So way back when, when I was in California, again, it was just the fan base. They lost a lot, <laughs> but the fan base was just amazing. <laughs> I totally get it. I totally get it. I, I, like I said, the Cleveland Browns this year, they did pretty well. They went far into the playoffs, which is the furthest they've been in many, 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 many years, decades, in fact. Because I mean, I remember like when I was a kid, they did decently, they get to the playoffs, but they always lost. But so like in my adult life, like for me, I had never had the Browns do well. And so for them to finally be doing well, I'm just like, and like the first playoff game when we beat the Steelers, like we were, it was, I think midnight when the game went off and we we're dead in the middle of freaking COVID. And I just I had so much energy in me that I needed to like, I, like I was so like, I, I couldn't sit still. Like I was like, ah, fidgety and everything. But of course I couldn't go outside because we're locked in because of COVID because of the curfew. But I was like, man, I like, of course it's like winter time too. the playoffs. It's like January. I'm like, but I want to go outside and run right now because I have so much energy and I'm so excited. And like, oh, I loved it. I loved it. Never in my adult life did I think I'd see the Browns do that well, even though I had always hoped. And this year, yeah. and this year I have great hopes for them. They have a great play. They have a great team, even better than last year. We're coming up on preseason. If everybody can stay healthy, knock on wood, I think we could really have a run, a serious run in the playoffs and really, really push for our first ever Super Bowl appearance and maybe Super Bowl win. That's my hope. Optimistic, very optimistic. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got my fingers crossed for you and your team. Thank you. <laughs> We're a great team this year, but we still, we could use all the support that we can get. <laughs> I want to break and play one of my games, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Okay, we're going to play this or that. Oh, okay. Yes. Basically, I'm going to name two things and you tell me this or that. Definitely. All right. The first one is 
weird or crazy? Oh, it depends on the subject, but I would say most likely I would hit up weird most of the time, even, even depending on the subject, but most of the time I would say weird. Me too. I'll say weird. Although my, my husband would say crazy. <laughs> okay. Number two, ketchup chips or all dressed chips. Okay. So I'm not a ketchup person at all, but ketchup chips are pretty delicious. But I have to say all dressed chips definitely win by a long shot in my book, just because I'm not a big ketchup fan. They're both so good. Mm -hmm. They're both so good. I love them. Okay. I could tell you a random story though about ketchup chips or was it all dressed chips? It, it might've been either. It was one of those. Cause obviously those are a Canadian thing. And this is just a quick story. So I was one time at WSU and WSU right afterwards was CCW. Like there was like an hour break in between the shows or something. And AJ Styles happened to be on that particular show for CCW. And uh, we were all sitting there talking, like people were just baffled at this time. I, I don't know if I lived in Canada yet or if I was getting ready to live in Canada. And, and AJ found out that I was moving to Canada or would just move there. And he was like, why did you move to Canada? So I tell him, I'm like, <laughs> like, oh, okay, that's cool. You know, whatever. He's supportive, obviously. He's like, have you ever had ketchup chips? And I'm like, I'd never heard of such a thing. Like, no, or all dress chips, one or the other. It was one or the other. And uh, I was like, no, I haven't. And he's like, oh, it's a Canadian thing and it's great. You've got to try it. And I was like, okay, cool, whatever. So then the next time I was living in Montreal and I was going to Ohio for a show, which AJ happened to be on. So I happened to bring him a huge bag of whatever particular potato chip that he was like, he likes, but you know, you look at AJ Styles and you see his body and you're like, he doesn't eat chips. I would imagine <laughs> so, but I took him a huge bag of chips anyway. <laughs> Yeah, guys, for those in the States who don't, or anywhere else in the world, don't know what uh, all dress chips are or ketchup chips, they're delicious. And just uh, let somebody know if you know them in Canada and they'll send you a bag, I'm sure. Yes, so good. So good. Christmas or Halloween? Oh, those are both my favorite. <laughs> I obviously, I love to dress up. I, I mean, wrestling is dressing up every day, basically. Mm -hmm. I was told by a drag queen one time when I told them that I was a professional wrestler that I was just a, a drag queen anyway, because like I was <laughs> up and, you know, doing that. And I was like, that is the best compliment I've ever had in my life. Um, but I love Christmas. I love being together with my family. Like the last several years I have, well, since I've mo basically moved to Canada, um, I have Christmas at my house every year. I love making big meals for my big Greek family, even though I have 0% Greek in me, my whole Greek family or hundred percent. But I mean, they also bring enough food to feed an army too. So, but I love it. And like, I learn to cook new things every year. So, I mean, it's hard for me to honestly pick between the both because I like them both so much, but I'm going to say Christmas just because of the family aspect and having everyone together and seeing my nephews and my nieces and everybody's so excited about the presents that they're getting. Same. Christmas for me and Halloween is definitely number two. I love dressing up. Me too. Obviously. I mean, women's wrestlers, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> fancy car or fancy house. Oh, fancy house. Mm -hmm. Like when I, when I see people with cars that are like $250,000, I'm like, what the f are you guys thinking? Like, that's going to last you how many years, but if you have a beautiful, fancy house, something that you're going to live in, it could be there for, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, depending on how long you live. Like I would, I, for me, like, as long as a car gets me from point A to point B, I'm mm -hmm. totally happy with it. Like I have a Hyundai now and I love it. It's my, my little baby. Like I don't need a BMW or Porsche or higher and higher and higher Ashton Martin and all that kind of stuff. I don't need that. Mm -hmm. that yeah. That's going to get me to point A to point B, but if somebody like touches my car, I'm going to want to murder them and I don't want to murder anybody. So <laughs> I'm happy. I'd rather just have a beautiful house and yes. fill it with lots of love and have it for many, many years. Yes. Yes. Okay. Last one only eat spaghetti or pizza on a deserted Island. Oh, 
Well, thank God it's deserted because with all those carbs and I'm only allowed to eat that. It's <laughs> disaster. <laughs> um, I would definitely say pizza. I like spaghetti a lot, but pizza, I mean, you could have it. I mean, spaghetti is spaghetti, right? Like there's not very many varieties, but pizza right. so many different varieties. You can get your fruit because I like pineapple on pizza. Don't. Oh, yes. Me. No, me too. Me too. <laughs> Don't at me, you people. Pineapple mm. belongs on pizza. Um, I like meat. I like the different vegetables. So I would go with pizza because you'd have a more different variety. Me too. Me too. I like those questions. Those are fun. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> well, why don't you tell us? Cause I mean, we really haven't talked about our podcast at all. Why don't you tell us about see you next Tuesday? Yes. So see you next Tuesday. I drop an episode every Tuesday at 7 p.m. My husband actually came up with the name for me and uh, funny story. I absolutely hate that word uh, when, <laughs> yeah, uh, he learned, he learned real quick at the beginning of a relationship to not say it around me. <laughs> so, but then when he said, see you next Tuesday, I laughed right away. And I'm like, to me and to him, it means something. That's why it's funny. Um, to other people, it's just funny. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, that's perfect. Um, you can catch it on anchor.fm slash jchung or on my YouTube. It's mostly audio, but every now and then I'll have a video podcast, uh, but you can check it out on my YouTube channel at uh, jchung11. So for you, you've had so many guests on your show, like amazing guests. Like for me, I have never seen, and I know, you know, him personally, obviously Scott Damore really do a podcast <laughs> and you had him on your show. I mean, you've had your husband a few times as well, which I don't think has done very many podcasts either. And, but obviously you're his wife. He's going to mine. Do he has to. Well. Yeah. <laughs> And Dan Murphy, he's a friend of my show as well. I mean, I have him on for month, every month for like a history lesson of the month, basically. Oh my and, goodness. Yeah. And I wanted to, I'm going to bring him on because the wrestlers wrestler came out a few months ago. I'm still reading it because with everything going on with being pregnant and doing a podcast and stuff, it's hard to read books as well. So once I finish his book, I'm going to have him on. So anyway, but I mean, you've had so many great guests. Yes. Yes. So I try not to talk about wrestling as funny as that sounds, but that's mainly because I really want people to know my guests in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, their personality, you know, how they are either on TV or, you know, live at an event, but do you actually know them? And I like to hit topics that have to, to deal with something that maybe, any of my listeners might be going through uh, in hopes that that will help them. So I try to, you know, bring up different topics and having Scott Demore on for two and a half hours, mm -hmm. a very candid interview um, was a lot of fun. And he was actually the very first person to book me. And so he couldn't really say no, cause he's known me for <laughs> so long. <laughs> Like, me too like I try to go like my podcast is mostly about wrestling but I like to get people and ask them questions that you know because like even like for example like I'll be like hey do you want to come on podcast I'm like oh, I don't really want to do another podcast <laughs> I'm like, yeah but mine's a little bit different because coming being a woman in the business and I'm sure you can attest to this as well even though you don't talk about wrestling as much like you can talk about wrestling in a different aspect than say somebody who loves wrestling, but has never bumped in their life or never mm -hmm. been a part of a wrestling show in their life. And as, a, and on top of that, which is also another great thing is there's a lot more women that are coming out with podcasts about wrestling, which I think is just amazing as well. So it's like, you get these different perspectives from all these different women and their experiences, plus the people that they're talking to. And like, I try to do not just wrestling. I try to mix it up a little bit. It's hard because wrestling is what I know, yeah. obviously, right? Like I want, I, I love paranormal stuff. Oh so no. Like, yeah. Oh me. I love it. I love it. And last October when I was starting my show, 
one of my friends who is on the travel channel with one of his show. Well, he has actually, he's been on a couple of the shows. I asked him to come on the show and he was like, yeah, yeah, sure. No problem. But this was like in August, like before I even started my podcast, I was like, awesome. So when I contacted him in October, he's like, yo, I'd love to, but like, it's October. I just don't have the time. And oh like, no. Oh shit. Like that was my whole intention of my, my, you know, Halloween episode, but it ended up well because I had, um, I know Brian O'Halloran from Clerks. So Dante from Clerks Mm -hmm. and he came on and he was such an amazing guest. So he's fantastic person anyway. So he was great to have on. And we talked about a bunch of different stuff. So like I try to do stuff that's not always wrestling, but it's like, what do you know? You got to stick to. Yeah. Right. So like 90%, I would say is women's wrestling, but I also have men obviously that I became friends with or that I know over time but I try to mix it up a little bit here and there. Yeah. Like it is hard. I mean, okay. So I lied. It's not completely, um, not about wrestling. Like we'll, we'll, we'll dabble in on it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of my guests have something to do with wrestling. So, um, a lot of it is how I have met my guests Mm-hmm. Now, and I love doing this with you because we've never met before, but I obviously knew who exactly who you were. I mean, it's hard to forget the, the red, the bright red haired yeah. girl. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's nice to talk and get to know somebody for the first time. Um, and like, like you were saying, like we talked for half an hour. I believe it was half an hour before we actually started recording. Yeah. And that was just so nice. It was a great little icebreaker. And I had already know, I already knew that you were good people. And that's simply because I absolutely love Jessica Havoc. Like I love and adore her so much. And then I started seeing like pictures. I think it was just recently, like a month ago, there was like, um, I was looking at her stories and then there was pictures, I guess she, uh, what, what is it? It's not retweeted, but like the Instagram stories that she, she posted that you posted of there. Um, you guys were jumping into a pool or something like that. I was like, Oh, Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah. Like super, super old school picture. Um, I was like, Oh, okay. So like, she definitely has to be like good people. If Jess is like really good friends with her. So I knew right then. And then of course, like talking to you already. Um, yeah, Yeah, super chill. (laughs) <laughs> way 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 back she was doing at that show that I was doing ring announcing for before I even started ring announcing um and maybe her first or second year in wrestling she was doing a, a giant a German giant gimmick because she's such she's such a tall individual like I don't know if that shows on tv she's like six foot tall like and most women are nowhere near six foot yeah so like I saw her and she was on, I, I want to say it was a six person tag and she was the only woman. And I was just like, whoever this person is, I want to know them. And um, I didn't choose the school that she was going to at the time that uh, she was wrestling, but she did come down and train with us quite a bit at OCW as well. And like, she wasn't that far from me. I think maybe like 20 minutes to a half hour, which is in wrestling, like crazy nothing that you yeah with or you know in wrestling lives that close to you yeah so I mean we were inseparable for a long time and then when we were at WSU they put me Jess and Allison together as a as a trio as the Midwest militia and oh my god some of the best times in my career like I could never ever forget some of those memories that we had you know and that photo shoot was one of the photo shoots we did we actually <laughs> There's another photo from that pool uh, scene that we did where we have a guy and we're drowning him in the pool, like we're putting his head into the pool. And like Jessica's like behind us, like, yes. And it's awesome. I'll have to share that picture because it's (laughs) but like some people are like, you girls are murdering a guy and you have like the biggest smiles on your face. (laughs) I love it. But like, I, I've known your husband um, for quite a while, been on shows with him and stuff too. I mean, I don't know him really, really well, 
but to know, like, but his reputation precedes him basically everywhere he goes. Everybody knows you're going to have a great match with him, you know, whoever's working with him. And in the locker room, he always says, hello, goodbye, totally respectful. So I know you being- Yeah, I don't know about that. Hang on, hang on one second. Well, every time I've I've (laughs) been in the locker room with him, like I said, not many times, but a few times, he's been very, very respectful, so. That was like one of our things is that I thought he was a complete dickhead because he, Uh, yeah, because he would never say hi. (laughs) He would just like stand and be like, hey. After that. (laughs) yeah maybe after that maybe after that yeah because I, mean, I was like that's rude you had to say hi to everybody yeah I didn't start wrestling in Ontario probably until I moved here in like 2000 late 2012 early 2013 maybe maybe even 2014 I'm not sure because I mean I didn't really wrestle in Ontario too too frequently so it was mostly here in Quebec. And if I wasn't wrestling in Quebec, I was heading down into the States for whatever promotion that weekend. But Ontario, I really, I wrestled beautiful Bia a couple times. And Alexia Nicole was my other opponent that I wrestled probably 90% of the time that I was wrestling in Ontario. So I didn't mm. really wrestle there. Maybe, maybe 10 times max, maybe less even. Mm. So. I wasn't on too many shows with Josh, but the ones that I were, I mean, he was always, like I said, seemed respectful, at least to me. I mean, he is, he is, he is a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> so funny though, that your first impression of him was that he was a dick. Oh yeah. He, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure he, he will say the same thing about me too. So, <laughs> well, there's a lot of wrestlers that, I mean, I could probably say like, weren't too friendly either, but like, whatever, like they didn't impact my day at all. So whatever. Like if they exactly they did, if they didn't, what I was didn't no sweat off my back. <laughs> oh man. Well, we have been talking, I mean, literally for like two hours now. So I think maybe we should go ahead and wrap up. <laughs> so why don't you go ahead and put over again your podcast and all of your social media? That way people know where they can find and look for you. Yes. So see you next Tuesday drops every Tuesday at 7 PM. Find my episodes at anchor.fm slash J Chung or on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash J Chung 11. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at J Chung 11. Awesome. And for me, I am sassy Steffi. If you haven't met me before, my podcast is talking sass. You can find it on your favorite podcast platform and also on YouTube. And you can find me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Sassy Steffi. You can find me on TikTok, which I just joined like a week and a half ago, and I'm having a blast on it. Never thought <laughs> I would say that in my life, but I'm having a blast on it at Talking Sass. So I love new followers. And I love to interact with people. So come follow me if you don't already. All right. Well, I think that pretty much does it. Jade, you want to follow up with anything before we close it out? Uh, I was going to say you should have just did my whole thing for me <laughs> you were much better well, I put I try to put everything at sassy Steffi or at talking sass so it's just easier to find me yeah because so like I know some people will be like you can find me at bob square one yes. or at square bob two or 93 square bob one and I'm like why do you have a hundred yeah three inches yeah up? So it's either Sassy Steffi or my podcast or, um, or Talking Sass. Um, also, I do have a Patreon. I forgot to mention. Um, lots of great content going up there. I have exclusives with each and every single guest. Tears start at only $2 for a whole month of content. That's less than what you pay for a cup of coffee a day for a whole month of content. So go check it out. Patreon.com slash Sassy Steffi. Oh, and I think that wraps it up for us. So until next time, guys. See you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Or in my case, next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Talk soon, guys. <laughs>